so you kind of you might be asking yourself uh why school software now um and just like many other industries um every year there's a new breaking record of um, publicly disclosed uh cyber security incidences and um you know the k through 12 school districts was um no exception to that so we noticed that there is a big uptick in that and then kind of um also tying into now um kids are going to start being used uh learning over the network and starting to use maybe a uh more um or more software in their day-to-day -day, uh learning habits we, we decided to take a look so that's kind of when we began to look for um software that is widely distributed has like one of the largest user bases uh, we try to think like a being a, an offensive security researcher we try to think like the the hackers and this is kind of what they would do um you know get the most bang for their buck if you would uh, if you will so this is when we stumbled upon netup um netup vision pro is the software that's used in the uh, school districts um, they have around six million teachers and students using their platform and over 9,000 school districts um, all across the globe. Uh, and the NetOp is actually the parent company um, that has like around 100 million users. So let me explain a little bit more about how the software is designed to be used and how COVID has actually made this um, uh, more vulnerable to attacks. Um, uh, NetOp Vision Pro is uh, primarily designed to actually be used in like computer labs or um, on-premise uh, classrooms, things like that. It's not necessarily actually designed to communicate over the internet. Um, it's primarily designed to be like a local network um, piece of software. However, with COVID-19, um, we noticed that there was an uptick in hybrid and e-learning. And this is where we kind of started to put these two together and how, um, Due to a lot of these students needing to borrow PCs or maybe a district uh, requires them to use a certain software set, um, might be letting the, these students bring home these computers. And I'm sure they didn't have time to go through and you know disable local only software um, like, like NetUp Vision Pro here. So we kind of identified a, a new attack vector here where um, software that has traditionally be confined into like the walled garden of the school district network can now be a little bit more exposed um, uh, if these students are bringing these home. So let me explain a little bit more about how the software works and kind of what it's um, designed to accomplish. Um, NetUp Vision Pro is actually a, like a student management uh, software. Um, the teacher kind of has like this overarching um, uh, control and view of all of the students on that's connected to their classroom at the time and the teacher can blank the screen remote control this computers um, block web access run applications even and then like log in or even shut down the computer um, and this is all to kind of facilitate the learning of these students and keep them on track when it's installed it's installed um, as a system service and uh, it is automatically started at boot so the students can't really disable it or anything. It's kind of tamper resistant in that way. Um, so uh, kind of now that we got the, the groundwork laid, uh, let's put our hack and shoes on and dive into some of the technical details. Um, like I said before, we like to think like the attackers and these are kind of the four goals that we set out to accomplish. And this is what I what we uh, think that would also be what the an attacker looking at the software would want to achieve. So we wanted, um, since there's no internet access, we wanted local network uh, access or local network attack. Uh, we wanted to see if we can get um, remote code execution on the machine. We wanted to see if the software is leaky and can potentially leak uh, Windows account comp uh, Windows account credentials. Um, and then we wanted to maybe <clears throat> try to see if we could uh, improve our position on the compromised machine by uh, privilege escalation. So the first thing we did was after we identified this as our target from the, the user base, we just went to the website and they actually offered a 30 day free trial, um, which uh, to a hacker is, you know, an in, indefinitely free trial. 
So we, uh, we, uh, we really like free trials. Um, you know, it's a good way to instantly get in there and start reverse engineering and kind of see how the software works and we don't have to you know, pay for it. But, um, I, I don't want companies to take that as a, a negative. So <laughs> keep offering free trials. Um, and then after that, uh, we kind of set up a test environment where we um, created a handful of VMs, uh, made one the teacher and the rest the students. And we kind of, at this stage, wanted to identify the most common install. So there, there's nothing worse than once, if you find a vulnerability and you realize you didn't check security or something um, uh, during the install process. So at this stage, we were trying to like, I make sure that our test environment here made the most sense and would be what we saw in the wild. Um, and this installer was actually pretty uh, simple. There was not mu much to change there. But um, so we set up uh, this little local network with um, a handful of students and a teacher. And then we began just poking around at the software. Uh, a lot of people think uh, all hacking is, is <laughs> in your basement with a, with a hoodie on. But a lot of it is actually just understanding the software to un to kind of identify where vulnerabilities lie. And this is a, a large part of our, our job is just trying to figure out how, how each of these functions. So the teacher, like I mentioned before, has quite a few actions that they can perform. Um, and we kind of wanted to narrow our scope here and see which ones would be the most interesting. And then lastly, um, we just, right before diving into, you know, the reverse engineering and, um, and debugging and whatnot, we wanted to identify the differences between the, the two installs, the student and the teacher install, um, and kind of identify if there was any overlap, if we found a vulnerability in one, could it affect the other? And uh, they were actually quite different. So the student uh, runs most of those plugins, or I mean, most of those actions that I showed in the previous slide um, with separate binaries. So when the teacher wants to, for instance, uh, open an application, it will use a, a, a plugin um, with it that has a different exe um, and the teacher uh, kind of just uses just the one one thing i want to point out is that all of the student installs actually run as system um, so i think that's to probably prevent students from tampering or disabling the 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 running applications and the teacher just actually runs as the normal teacher so now that we have uh you know kind of the the setup going um Let's uh, go back into our goals and start going through them one by one. So the first thing that we wanted to do is just kind of look at the network and see how um, the teacher and the student communicate. And that's pre pretty quickly we identified that um, uh, all of the traffic was unencrypted. Um, even things that we considered sensitive, like right here, this is a on the, um, the top here. This is uh, the action where the a teacher is trying to log in remotely to the student PC and they can type in Windows username and password. Um, they actually block it from here. So you could, they, they blocked the uh, password from being viewed, but not in the Wireshark capture. So in the Wireshark capture, all of the, the credentials were just passed in plain text. Um, any eavesdropper on the network could have captured that. And it's not only the credentials that were passed in plain text. Um, for instance, when the teacher was going to run an application on the student computer, that was also passed in plain text, um, as well as uh, soon as the students are connected to a classroom, they instantly begin sharing their screenshots like these. And those were also passed in unencrypted, not in plain text necessarily, but uh, using a piece of software like DriftNet, it can uh, you know, pull these JPEG images out over the wire and kind of display them in semi real time view of the students, um, all just kind of being a passive listener on the network. So just to kind of fill in the system architecture now, we can add the network traffic and the green unencrypted because <laughs> uh, no, none of the traffic that we identified was actually encrypted. And this was our first finding and our first CVE that we, we, we filed against them. Um, of clear text transmission of sensitive data. Uh, not only the Windows credentials, but also commands can be you know, seen um, as well as the screenshots. And to kind of just highlight on how simple this is for an attacker, 
um, all they would need to do is have access to the local network where the students are, have a Wi-Fi card or a network card that has promiscuous mode, and just a simple free uh, wire uh, network sniffer that can you know, tra capture that traffic. Um, so if we look back at our goals, we didn't actually get a local network attack since we haven't attacked anything. We, we were kind of just passively listening, but we were able to actually compromise Windows accounts. So um, just seeing that, that if the teacher used that login function, uh, we, we would be able to capture those. So the next we wanted to do is try to see if we can get remote code execution on the, on the student, seeing that the network traffic is uh, unencrypted. And we wanted to do that. Um, first, we wanted to see if we can actually just emulate a teacher, seeing that a lot of the, the actions a teacher can perform on a student remotely is already a great step in the right direction. Um, you know, being able to run applications, for instance, that to an attacker is a, a wonderful thing. <laughs> so we wanted to see if there was, uh, if we could now just emulate this unencrypted traffic um, uh, ourselves and kind of become a teacher. Um, and these are just a few of the, the things that a teacher can you know, get um, or an attacker could get from emulating teacher. Uh, the students always trust the teachers. The te they, they can't deny um, teacher requests or actions at all. Um, it doesn't matter if it's school time or not. <laughs> if a teacher says to run this application, there's no way the student can disable that. Um, and then uh, they also just start sharing screenshots, like I mentioned before. So how would the teacher, or how would we as an attacker, you know, try to find these students on the network? Um, it's actually quite simple. The students, uh, act, the student client actually starts beaconing out their presence on the local network um, uh, every few seconds actually. And you can see here, um, we got uh, in this Wireshark capture, the student computer name, um, their MAC address and their IP address all just kind of being broadcast out every, every few seconds. And it's kind of everything an attacker needs to kind of create a list of these um, targets on the network and kind of enumerate through each of them to um, perform this emulation attack, if, if you will. Um, but first, we had to see how the t student and the teacher actually make the connection together um, and how they begin to send commands or whatever. And that's when we started to look at the handshake between the teacher and the student. And I want to point out that there's these two UDP messages before. Um, so the teacher actually sends a UDP message to the student, um, and then the student responds with a UDP message. But the, the first connection is actually the student talking to the teacher. So the teacher is actually the listening socket. The student is the one that initiates the, the, the connection. Um, kind of after this, uh, the, these first UDP packets of the teacher kind of telling the student to connect. So the student makes the connection um, and it's an around 11 packets in a handshake yeah. with uh, from just diffing multiple handshakes. We actually only identified three unique elements within that handshake across different um, student computers and, and different teachers. So most of it was actually just a static replay um, for when we wanted to actually emulate it. But first we had to identify how these three unique elements were, were um, being created. And to identify those, we kind of dove into some more packet captures and some reverse engineering. And we identified that the first unique element was uh, just a teacher ID. So each teacher has a static uh, unique ID. And then the second one was the same, but for a student. And the third one actually was uh, quite quite a mystery from the majority of our research. We kind of just lay, uh, left it as token three, like in this Python output here from one of our scripts. Um, however, uh, after being in WinDebug for so long, um, that address, I mean, this token three started to look a little bit more familiar. And uh, if we actually ran the address command on it, it was this student was actually broadcasting out their heap address for some reason. Um, I don't know why. I, I really was hoping to use that in some kind of like ASLR bypass or um, a heap exploit or something, but uh, never got around to using it. But I just thought that was a, a very uh, interesting way of sending a, 
I don't know, a u- unique ID over the network. Um, so now that we kind of understand how the handshake is com- complete, uh, completed and how to find these students on the network, uh, we started to just write some, some Python scripts to actually do the emulation. Um, we use Scapy, so these are some Scapy layers over here. And I want to just kind of point out that not all of the fields we did identify, some of them are still UKW unknowns. Um, so uh, we identified as much as we could, but they were they were static. So we actually didn't really need to know what they were um, in the end. And then this is kind of just a simple uh, script showing how we can emulate running a command, uh, remote code on the student PC. And you can see that all we're really changing here is the target IP and then those tokens every once in a while. Um, and then lastly, the command. So most of it was just a straight replay actually. And I'll, I'll kind of show a demo here of, of this. So the, these three Windows PCs are actually um, just the student PCs. And this is our attack script. And so all it did was right there, it, it happened really quick, but it scanned on the network for five seconds, actually found all of these compute computers beacons and then just ran PowerShell. And we're doing it again right here. So scanning for five seconds. And this time we're going to run calculator. So it creates a list, goes through each of them, and then just replays that handshake with our the dynamic fields updated. And we just replace the command with what we want. So we um, kind of used that as our, our code execution. Um, and that was our second finding, actually, um, an incorrect authorization, since there was no way that the student actually can identify if that teacher is their teacher or if it's a Python script like it is here. <laughs> um, that, that That's a problem. So we filed this one against them. And uh, so we now have um, you know a local network attack now, and we can do some uh, code execution on the student. Um, but we still haven't uh, increased our privileges. So in our in the last example where we're running calculator, for instance, that is actually being executed as the student. So um, it is correctly cho- uh, dropping the privileges from the um, the main by- executable that is running as system to that of the student. So uh, even though all of the plugins and um, the service files are all running as you know system on the on the machine. Uh, they actually have code in place to identify the the logged in user and drop the privileges to that. Um, so we wanted to see if there was any way to you know bypass that, or if, since we have access to you know unencrypted network traffic, if there was a field or whatnot that we could pass that could um, bypass that. And that's kind of when we started to dive into. Uh, well, we've been in, in, we've been doing some of this reverse engineering this whole time, but this was the first time that we kind of started to look at how the privileges were getting dropped. And uh, as you can see on the left here, this is just all wrapper code for um, identifying which student or which user is logged in, and then calling shell execute way down here um, with you know the, the application that the teacher wanted to execute. And there was a path just going straight to shell execute. You can see right here that all it's doing is it's skipping all of the, the wrapper code to find which user it is and, and essentially just running as system. However, we didn't. there was no way to actually change the variable that was setting us onto this path. It was like read from registry at boot and, and nothing over the network um, could really get us to, uh, to change that. So, that was a failed attempt of just you know finding something in the network that we could we could uh, modify to get system execution, but uh, it kind of got us thinking if all of the code or all of the shell executes are wrapped in this um, uh, code to drop privileges, and that's kind of when we started diving in to all of the binaries, not just the main one, uh, and that's kind of where we we identified that there were a, a few that weren't actually. So you can see right here, there's a shell execute down here that doesn't have any of that wrapper code. And these were all, unfortunately, local privilege escalations. So none of these um, shell executes actually were, uh, you couldn't, they never digested user input. So we couldn't run arbitrary commands. 
um, and they also um, were all all needed a mouse, so <laughs> a mouse based exploit. Um, and the, this is just the first one I'll kind of highlight on is, um, for instance, this one was if you right click on the icon and click help, it will bring up a um, a, a window with their support web page in it pre filled, and so it it starts Internet Explorer as system, and then there's ways that you can just right click on save as and things like that. And if you click on uh, CMD or whatever, you can you can usually execute that. So that was our third finding and um, uh, our third CVE that we filed for incorrect privilege assignment. But this is still not what we wanted. We still wanted to be able to do this kind of privilege escalation over the network. And so that's kind of when we started to dive into um, some of the other plugins and how they were, were handling it. And it kind of brought our attention back to when we were downloading the free trial, when we saw this change log here where it said, <laughs> We fixed an issue where the teacher sends a file to the student and the student clicks on it, it launches as the system context. Um, that was important in two, two ways. For one, this chat client can send files, which is always good to have a, uh, a primitive to drop files on a remote system. And it clearly has had pro uh, problems in the past with privilege assignment. Um, so. You could see, like I mentioned before, all of the plugins are still running as system. So um, that's probably how it inherited that system context. Um, so we kind of, at this point, diverted our attention to this chat feature. Um, and we wanted to see how the file operations worked. And that's when we actually identified that this chat function was way more feature complete than we thought. Um, I thought it was just going to be a simple instant messenger, but uh, it actually has primitive, or I guess not primitives, but um, the ability for the teacher to uh, actually kind of view the remote file system of like the students, which is kind of interesting. So this is a teacher view. Um, this is how the teacher would see it. And if they click on the student, it will actually like show you their file system and you can actually go into traverse these these paths, but the only thing that um, you can't do is like there's no like the dot dot directory or whatnot to to go back up. So we're we're kind of confined to their my documents folder here, and um, but we can still from there you know view, copy, delete um, files. So that was a pretty pretty great finding right there for us. Um, but next we wanted to kind of figure out if these file operations were wrapped in that wrapper code to you know, drop privileges, for instance, to, or if these file operations um, were also running as a system like the, the plugin is. And that's kind of when we dove back into IDA and found out that they were actually doing all of the file operations as system. And then only at the very end, <clears throat> kind of just, ch modding 777 the file just setting the access to everyone um so they just that that was their easy solution to make sure that the student can um can view these files i guess and so this was actually our our fourth finding and actually our highest uh cvss score um, because we now have a remote primitive of system level file uh, file system access um, remotely uh, on these students based on this. Um, so to kind of highlight on on the impacts here, we we definitely wanted to figure out if we could uh, traverse back up to maybe the C drive, for instance. Um, and that's kind of when we dove into this convoluted path and actually found a way that the the teachers do control. The, this remote path of the student. So you can see right down here at the very end, um, you can just type in whatever you want. So being uh, trying to get a system level execution on the computer, um, we decided to just change this to the C drive, navigate to the, the folder where um, the other NetOp Vision plugins exist over delete one and drop in some malware, I'll just call it, um, where then we know that that 
software will eventually be executed with the system context. Um, and we can just use our emulation script to kind of uh, automate all of that. So, and that's exactly what we did. And I'll, I'll show some of the Python code here of how, how we got um, system level access uh, or system level code execution remotely on these students. Um, so the first step we did is we, all we need to do is find those students on the network. Like I said, just scan for the network for five seconds and we can usually make a list of them. Then we enumerate through the list and we start a, um, a chat thread um, in the background, um, just like how the student connects to the teacher. Um, the teacher is the listening socket, the same with this chat um, feature. Um, the student connects to that. So we, we started a listening chat thread. Um, then we send the UDP broadcast message telling the student to connect to us. We grab those three unique tokens um, from the handshake. Um, and then we, we, we finish the handshake with those tokens in there. And then in this stage, the in the background, the mchat uh, thread here will um, <clears throat> ch uh, change the root directory to the NetOpVision pro, uh, pro install directory, delete one of the plugins, drop in our malware, and then just exit. And then right here, we're calling, um, we overwrote the screenshot viewer, for instance. So this is a screenshot viewer plugin. So in this, this call is now just emulating uh, us being the teacher of starting that screenshot viewer plugin. And then we just drop out. Um, and to kind of show all of that happening in real time and kind of showing how fast it is, I'll, I'll play this little video, this demo here. S same thing. Um, so all the teachers, or I mean, all the students are around the top, and then this is the attacker. Um, in this, I'm just kind of showing that they're all just normal users uh, with real time protection and whatnot, kind of on like a standard install. I'm sure maybe a, a school district would probably have more running, but this was kind of what we decided would be normal. And um, so, right there, I was just showing that none of the students are connected to anything. And so we'll start our emulation script again. And this time we've added just a dash S for system and then our binary of choice, uh, choosing. And so it scanned for five seconds, found the three vulnerable computers, and then we'll enumerate through each of them and then begin starting this uh, reverse shell um, for each of them. So um, they will all eventually get uh, compromised here. <laughs> and one thing I want to point out is since we are emulating the teacher pretty much um, stock, this, this, these client, you know, this disconnect warnings do pop up. But um, as soon as we're done, we can disconnect. So uh, you can see like right there that it just says disconnected. So uh, could raise suspicion, I guess, but it was the best we could do. And now from the attacker screen, if we run like PowerShell, um, we can do a who am I? And we are actually running as system all remotely. And just to kind of give a visual, I'll just start calculator there. Um, and since we're, we're running out of time, I'll skip over the other two, just open calculator too. So <laughs> you're not missing much. But um, to kind of highlight on some of the impacts of the system level privilege remote code execution, um, is that this could technically be a wormable um, infection where if a well-designed malware, for instance, was just laid dormant waiting for these other beacons from other um, software that was vulnerable to this, um, the other NetApp Vision Pro clients, it could eventually kind of further the spread. And like I mentioned before, since these students are kind of taking these devices off of the, the district network, um, it's always running in the background. It's starting at boot. You know, the students can't disable it. it doesn't matter which network it's connected to. It, it's still listening. So, um, you know, if they brought their computer to a public cafe or a library and an attacker saw them there and was able to um, run this kind of attack on them and then, you know, lie dormant. And if they bring it back to the school network, the school network could be compromised. Um, lastly, uh, so we disclosed this to um, net up on 12 11 2020 and they we followed our 90 days disclosure period they were really responsive and actually got it patched um, before the 90 days um, and so the patch version is 9.7.2 and um, we publicly released on 321 21 um, 
thank you again for for tuning into the talk and uh i'll be in the q a session uh, a little bit later i hope to answer some of your questions thank you <laughs>